Entrepreneur Challenge. I had to catch my there, myself there for a second because it's no longer just Memphis Cypreneur because for the first time ever, we've been able to combine all the chapters across the state into one comprehensive program. And I know we're really excited to be able to do this. Uh, this program is always a ton of fun. We have a blast putting it on. And now that it's gonna be bigger and better than ever, I hope you all will enjoy it as well. So for those who don't know me, my name is Ryan Hughes. I am this year's director of Memphis Cypreneur. This is my second year as the director and fourth being part of the program. I won't go into too many details about the program because Brian will touch on this in a bit, but I just wanna say that this is a 10 week entrepreneurship program taught by college professors, ran by entrepreneurs and guided by successful figures in the Memphis area, all for free. Not only that, but the program culminates in a pitch competition where everyone gets rewarded and the top three teams win up to $500 per person in cash. So I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty darn good deal, especially with today's inflationary prices. So before I turn it over to Brian, I just wanna quickly thank all the inventors for being here. I mean, it means a lot to us that you're taking time out of your busy schedules to share your work with us. I wanna thank BioTN and the Tennessee Academic Alliance for all their support. And last but not least, all the Tennessee research institutions, you know, without everyone helping out and being part of Cypreneur, none of this would be possible. So again, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Hey, Brian. Hey, everybody. My name is Brian Berenger. Uh, I'm right over here in the bottom right-hand corner of my little screen there. Uh, and I'm going to, let me pin this real quick. All right. Okay. So, hey again, my name is Brian Berenger. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Christian Brothers University. Welcome everybody to another year of the Cypreneur Challenge. This year, like Ryan said, we are going statewide. We have IP from a large variety of uh, entities and organizations across the state and a very good turnout of people that are willing and, and able and excited about working on each one of these IPs to see which ones we can commercialize. Hopefully we can figure out ways that each one can go to some sort of tech transfer commercialization process and hit the market. That's the goal of this whole process. Today, we're gonna go through uh, a few things, high level stuff. We're not gonna get into the content until next week as far as education and entrepreneurship goes. Uh, but today we will go through the calendar of events again that we did last week, kind of walk through what's gonna happen over the next several weeks. We'll also do a few icebreaker exercises just to kind of get everybody gelled and ready to go for, uh, for the session and everybody working together. Uh, and uh, we'll just kind of cover a few things. We'll have plenty of time for question and answers, uh, especially also when we go through the IP parade and discuss each one of the IP, which uh, Rohan Isaac is gonna walk through us for those uh, here in a bit. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, it's Memphis Challenge 2022. I'm so glad everyone's here. Uh, it's gonna be a good time. Uh, I wanna talk about our program facilitators first. We have uh, uh, Dr. Erica Dillard, uh, who's not here tonight because she's uh, on some other things, but she is, uh, been a part of this for a long time, part of Bio10 for the Memphis area, and actually is commercializing her own IP at the moment as well. So it's, it's great to have her both as uh, someone who's been involved in this for several years, as well as a facilitator and someone who's commercializing this kind of technology. We also have Dr. Ryan Hughes, a director of cyber and uh, entrepreneurship. God, you'd think I say that word 10,000 times a day, and I, now I'm having difficulty saying it. Uh, so he's the director of cyber and entrepreneurship at Bio10. Uh, you just heard from Ryan. Uh, he's also been involved in this in the past, and it's been a, a really great relationship to work with both Erica and Ryan. Uh, I already introduced myself. My name is Brian. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center at CBU, and my co-founder is Shelby Pranit. She's on here as well. She'll be helping me facilitate the whole process and the program, and she'll also be one of our resources for office hours uh, and answering any questions you might have. And then finally, Dr. Rohan Isaac, who was a participant last year and now has graduated up into the facilitation role, uh, and that's really great. He's gonna help us walk through the IP. Again, he's been involved in this whole process uh, and we just you know, decided, hey, let's just uh, bring him up to work with us. And, and he's been a great resource. So we're really, really happy we have him. All right, so just real quickly, I mean, look at this slide here. This is a ton of people that are involved in this. We have entities all across the country, uh, sorry, up across Tennessee, uh, someday the country maybe, but today it's just Tennessee. And that's important enough. So all these organizations are providing IP. A lot of these organizations, individuals and participants in this program are a part of. It's grown to be a really large program, which we love. 
Uh, we've got a lot of IP to discuss tonight, and I think it's going to be a really interesting evening as well as entire cohort as we work through these things. All right, so here's a good definition of entrepreneurship. I just kind of want to set the stage for what we're talking about. And I, I think this is a, a great statement. It does kind of explain uh, the entrepreneurial spirit and kind of how entrepreneurs are. An entrepreneur is someone who jumps off a cliff and builds a plane on the way down. And that is true. Uh, and I think what it speaks to here is more about the ability for an entrepreneur to be adaptive, right? You have to be able to take the punches, understand what it's going to take, that not every question has an answer that sometimes can be difficult for scientists and people like yourselves that are always striving to find the factual science and the things and the answers and the things. Some things are just not uh, necessarily answerable right off the bat. And so there's a lot of discovery. But the good thing about this is that this crowd understands the method that we use in entrepreneurship too, which is very much a scientific method where we observe and, and we build hypothesis and we test those. And then we generate documentation on what we found. We make pivots and edits to our theories and hypotheses. We retest, we gather more information, and then basically we publish by going live with our product. So it follows very much along the same lines as the traditional scientific method, which I'm assuming everyone on this call is very familiar with. So this is a good definition to kind of give you what that high level overview of what an entrepreneur is. They are generally an individual who's willing to take that leap of faith. I like this one a little bit better though, because it, it gives a little bit better understanding about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is an attempt to create value through recognition of business opportunity, the management of risk taking appropriate to the opportunity and through the communicative and management skills to mobilize human financial material resources necessary to bring a project to fruition. Yeah, it's a lot more words. I like the other one from its kind of brassness and boldness, but this one is more realistic. It takes a lot to be an entrepreneur and it takes a lot for people to launch products into the market. It's not an easy job. If I've always said that if you want that 40 hour a week job, that's great. I tend to work about hundred hours a week, so I never have to work a 40 hour week. But that's because entrepreneurs just tend to fill their plate with everything they need to be successful as far as bringing a product to market. And we're going to walk through a lot of these things so you have an understanding of what these risk-taking opportunities are, how to communicate and manage everything that is needed to mobilize all the things you need, the talent, the human assets, the financial funding that you need, and the material resources to go to market and bring a project to fruition. It's all a part of it. So that's what we're going to walk through this uh, today. I mean, over this cohort. All right. So just real quickly today, we're going to do a, a couple of icebreakers uh, throughout this. We have an IP parade where Rohan is going to walk through each one of the IP with the each one of the inventors. Uh, then we'll do some submissions on the IP choice that you want. So we're going to let you actually choose which IP you would like to work on. Not everyone's going to get their first, second, or third pick necessarily, but we're going to try. And we've been pretty successful over the last few years of doing this and giving everybody at least the first or second choice. We have a lot of IP and we got a lot of participants, so we're going to do our best. If you don't get on the IP project that you want, just understand that the value of this program is to learn how to commercialize your products, how to be an entrepreneur, how to understand what it takes to go to market. Everything I just said in that, in that quote before. So even if you're not working on the IP that you specifically wanted to work on or dying to work on, you will learn something if you take advantage of what we're trying to show you and share here. Uh, we'll also have Q&A during the IP parade as well as at the end to talk about anything we need. And we'll have one final icebreaker before we break for the evening. Okay, so one thing I wanna do real quickly is go through the uh, program again. Let me share my screen here. All right. So everyone should see the calendar now. Someone give me a thumbs up, Rohan, thank you very much. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be doing over the next several weeks. Uh, between now and the end of this program. We're starting off with week one, going through the IP. This is the biggest part of the night is trying to show you what we have and what pick the teams. Next week, we'll start more about entrepreneurship. We'll go into more detail about the tools we use. We'll talk about design thinking. Uh, that's very important to understand how to be creative and how to understand how to be creative. Uh, we'll go through a tool that we have called the Idea Discovery Canvas. Really, we're going to be using that through most of this program to help you facilitate gathering the data you need to build a business plan. Uh, market identification, problem framing, each one of these next two weeks, week two and week three is all about product market fit. So from problem framing into week three, we'll go into customer discovery and solution framing. 
By the time we get through the first two weeks, you should have a good understanding of what the problem is, what your customer segmentation and targets are, and what solution you're going to bring to the market. I know everyone has a solution. This IP is basically, quote unquote, a solution. But how well does that solution fit to the market and to the customers? That's what we'll discover in the first two weeks after this week, week two and week three. All right, Paige, come on. All right, I got so much technology going on here. There we go. All right, so then week four, we'll go into the regulatory side of things, start talking more about customer solution. Uh, but specifically, we'll go into value proposition. Value proposition is all about the pains and gains, how many pains we can alleviate and how many gains we can provide. So in the areas of pharmaceuticals or medical devices, obviously alleviating pain is a lot of what these things can do. But we also want to see how we can generate gains for these individuals as well. That could be a healthier lifestyle. It could be just more information about their diagnosis and what have what they have and what they have to what they'll be facing. So there's a lot about understanding what the value proposition is for each customer, and that's what we'll discuss in week four, as well as how to protect your intellectual property. I know a lot of y'all have patents. Some of y'all are working towards those. We'll go over some of those things. There are other protections against intellectual property that are not as uh, straightforward. Uh, one of the hardest ones. To do, but one of the best ones to have is just pure execution. Out executing every competitor you have is always the best way to protect your intellectual property as far as being in the market and generating revenue off of that market. Week five, we'll start talking about finances. This is when we have our uh, second uh, guest speaker, the first week in week four with our regulatory. Then we go into the week five, we'll have someone come in and talk about finances and economics. Uh, we'll also talk about channels and go to market. Uh, and corporate formation, which is also important to understand what kind of business you'll have to join, you know, form in order to be successful in delivering a product to market. And most importantly, taking on funding, if that's where we go. Uh, from there, we'll talk about the corporate funding. We'll have another guest speaker come in there. And this is the first week we all start talking about the pitch. Uh, we have a Google Drive, and we'll talk about those later on in the evening about all our tools that we have available to you. Um, one thing is going to be our standard temp template for our pitch. Everyone's gonna be using the same thing. It takes the information that we discovered in the first several weeks, and then you start to put that inside the, the pitch and we start building a narrative around your product and your, and your business. Week seven, we'll do pitch practice. You see how important this pitch is gonna be because it leads up to our last week where everybody will presenting their, their content, their pitches, their IP and everything else. So in that seventh week, we'll do some more pitch bracket. Eighth week, we'll have a guest speaker, uh, another former participant in this and someone who's been around the Cypreneur for a number of years, Dr. Isaac Rodriguez, uh, founder, co-founder of Sweet Bio. Some of y'all might know of Isaac, so he'll come in and talk to us in week eight. Week nine, we'll do pitch practice again with a full rehearsal. And each one of these weeks, we'll still be discussing content and making sure it's right. We're just going to be doing it in the process of building out their deck or your deck. And then week 10, and we hope this to be in person. Right now, we have it as TBD as far as where we're going to be, but we've done this virtually as well, very successfully. So if that's the way we'll do it, we'll have to do it that way as well. But we're trying to do this in person. But that 10th week will be a formal pitch from each one of the teams to our panel of judges. And that's when Ryan was alluding to all the uh, just uh, cornucopia of prizes that will be coming towards the winners and the participants in those programs. So it's a big deal. We take it pretty seriously. We like to have fun during this whole program. We, we joke a lot. We laugh a lot. Uh, but we are serious about the end result, which is delivering solid, high quality pitches that really deliver your plan on how to commercialize these IPs that we're going to be talking about today. All right. So any questions from what we've talked about so far, as far as programming goes, I'll take one or two, if there are any. Nope. Perfect. All right. Let's keep moving forward then. All right. So the first thing we got is an icebreaker. Uh, so Everyone of this last two years, we've all gone virtual. And, and that is something that I never thought would happen utilizing all these virtual tools for a number of years before that. And I think the, the thing I've heard the most and seen the most is you're on mute, right? Everyone says you're on mute. Everyone does, has this problem. There's even products out there right now that have big red buttons to help you remember if you're on mute or not. I almost bought one the other day for this very reason, just to make sure. Uh, and I thought it was pretty cool. But uh, you know, other than that, Everyone in chat, I'm going to give you a couple minutes. Think of something that's happened that's pretty funny or something that's you witnessed or been a part of that you had in some sort of virtual meeting over the last two years. So let's make a little fun about what we've been having to go through over the last couple of years. So drop that into chat. And I'll read a few of them out. You got two minutes. I could sing some background music, but I don't think anybody would appreciate that. Oh, 
All right, who's going to be the first? I don't have anybody in chat drop anything in there yet. Hopefully, I see a lot of people feverishly typing away. We do expect a level of participation during this program, so this is kind of the first example. All right, so I'm going to start because uh, I haven't got oh got one, but I'm going to still tell mine first. I was on a class. I, I had to move my classes to online in 2020 and 20, you know, early late 2020. Uh, and for some reason, uh, the movie of the birds kind of happened right outside my window at home. I had three birds just kind of come and crash against the window, and that's kind of interesting in itself. But the sound I made when it did it, I don't want to repeat. It was quite obnoxious and it scared the crap out of me uh, and it was in a big meeting in a, a kind of a classroom setting with a lot of people and it was uh, quite fun everybody laughed and I thought it was a good time but that was the craziest thing that happened to me over the last couple of years all right so here's another one uh, one of my cats used to love playing with my laptop keyboard during my zoom calls I think everybody's got that I've seen those things where people have bought little computers for their cats because apparently if you buy them a little computer it's because they want to do what you're doing and they'll go do it on their own little computer. So I highly recommend buying a toy little computer and seeing if that works. Uh, oh, I've got a bunch of them now. Uh, my coworkers who I really do love still don't just automatically mute and every week it is a thing. Yes, people not even knowing how they're mute, things are going on in the background, they're having conversations, sometimes gets fairly inappropriate and, uh, and equally as funny during those times. Uh, so here's one from Andy. Uh, I was to host a meeting, but my laptop wouldn't connect. I think that's happened to all of us. It's a pain. Uh, I lied down for a minute while waiting. Oh, it's hang on. And apparently my laptop connected with the Zoom window meeting minimized. So the group that did saw me lying down uh, on the way, hang on, let's go lying down and we're waiting for several minutes for me to run the meeting. So basically you are running the meeting, yet they caught you laying down because your computer hadn't started up yet. That's hilarious. All right, one more. Uh, a person accidentally turned on the audio off instead of muting their microphone. She kept on talking over the phone with a friend. Everyone could hear their whole conversation. I, the number of times I'm sure that happened is in the thousands, right? I mean, there are so many things that have been recorded on accident during this thing. So thank you all very much. It took you all a few minutes. I see why everybody was typing some pretty good stuff. So we did have about 12 or 13 people submit their uh, uh, stuff for this first icebreaker. I think that's fantastic participation. I'm really, really pleased with that. So thank you very much. All right. Good participation. Always love that. Being a professor, that's one of the things we look for the most. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Rohan Isaac, uh, and he is going to step us through uh, the variety of IPs that we're going to be showcasing today and utilizing through this program. Rohan, all yours. And come off mute. So, hello, everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, as uh, Brian said, I'm here to introduce uh, each of our uh, professors who's uh, going to introduce each of their own intellectual properties. Uh, I'll ask if you have questions during the, their presentations, uh, please pop them in the chat so they can answer after the fact. We'll open it up after uh, to questions that you can, you can speak out loud. Uh, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and start introducing our speakers. First off, we have Dr. Tarek Hawazi, who is an assistant professor of plant molecular biology in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Hirizi earned his bachelor's and master's degree from the Department of Crop Sciences at Minofia University, Egypt. He was awarded his doctorate degree in plant biosciences from the National Polytechnic Institute in Toulouse, France. Following his PhD, Dr. Hirizi accepted a postdoctoral position at the Jeune Plant INP in Saturn, France, where he worked in the area of sunflower functional gen genomics after this, he worked as a postdoctoral research associate and later as an associate scientist at the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology at Iowa State University before joining the department at UTK. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and let Dr. Rizzi uh, share his intellectual property. This is Brian. Right before we get started, for each person that's going to be presenting the intellectual property, if you can come on camera so we can see your face, and let me know if you need me to give you co-host ability so you can show a deck or anything. Okay. <clears throat> so do you have my presentation or I have to share with you guys? No, I'm going to make you a co-host and then you'll be able to share. Yeah, go ahead and share your own slides. Okay.
second. Okay, so, so can you see it? Yes, we can see, great, thanks. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about the discovery of new resources of genetic resistance against root knot nematodes in tomato and other plant species. So in agriculture, in fact, we have a major problem. It's called root knot nematode. This is a worm that infects roots of thousands of crop plants. So, and cause over $100 billion annual crop loss every, every year. So the problem with that is there is not any genetic resistance exists in wild plants against this war. So, and also several, you know, management strategy to control this nematode infection in crop plants is, uh, are ineffective. So as you can see here, this can infect tomato plants. This is a field of infected of root knot nematode, this carrot, lettuce, potato, cucumber, soybean, this for example. At least it's safe to say this nematode or this pathogen can infect every single plant in earth. This is a problem. Once it's introduced in any area, so it's very difficult to get rid of it. So what is the solution? It's to identify new genetic resistance and develop nematode resistant varieties. So this can be used in field in different crop plants. So our approach rely on identifying what we call nematode effector proteins. In fact, what makes nematode a pathogen is their ability to infect and secrete what we call effector or pathogenity factor. So as you can see here in the left, so this is a nematode. We have a gland here and the, where the uh, effector protein are synthesized in this gland that you can see the arrow and secreted through a needle-like structure and outside, this is an active secretion. This protein secreted or injected into plant root cells. So this is the main factor. This is what enabled the nematode to infect plants. As you can see here, it's an active secretion of the nematode. It's the N, it's nematode indicate nematode. It, this is the nematode head as it's active secretion of one of the effector in plant cells that are indicated by asterisk. So what is the approach to identify genetic resistance against this uh, nematode is to identify this effectors, nematode effectors protein or nematode pathogenity factor. And the, their plant interacting protein. So in fact, once this effector or this nematode protein secreted into plant cell, they interact with plant protein. And this interaction change protein or host protein structure, function, localization, association with other protein. We'll consider that plant protein as a susceptibility factor. So in fact, we have two factors. One factor is, in your right hand, it's nematode effector. In your left hand, it's plant protein. So our approach is to identify novel effectors and their plant interactors. The plant interactors we consider as a susceptibility factors. We can man manipulate the susceptibility factors and we'll be able to generate resistance. 
So what we did, we identified using a very complicated approach of bioinformatics and cell biology and in situ hybridization, you know, we identified about 11 novel nematode effectors. And this effector are expressed specifically in the gland, as you can see here, the signal one, it's subventral gland, subventral gland, this dorsal gland, dorsal gland, dorsal gland. So this nematode effector, it should be expressed specifically in this gland because they are connected directly to the nematode spirit, which a needle-like structure nematode use to inject this nematode effector into plant cells. So the first step, we identify 11 nematode effectors that are specifically expressed in the gland cells. Then we use used hybrid screen to identify plant interactive proteins. As you can see here, we have 11 effector. This is nematode effector or nematode protein or nematode pathogenic factor. It's R in red, taking the number from one to 11. And in yellow, this is a plant or tomato interacting protein. This is the nematode tomato interaction map, protein protein interaction map. So in fact, we are able to identify about 118 tomato protein interacting with 11 nematode effector. We consider this G encoding for this 118 nematode uh, protein, uh, protein uh, tomato protein as a susceptibility factor. So we have 118 genes that can be manipulated to make a plant resistant. Just I want, you know, I want to, you know, to pay attention to this gene or this protein, these are targeted what circle in green. They are targeted by how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This one tomato protein is are targeted by seven different nematode effectors. As another case here, we have this another tomato protein that are targeted by one, two, three, four, five. What we discovered that we found that at least 20 tomato protein that are targeted but at least two different effectors. So our discovery is that the 118 tomato protein can be suppressed, can be used, you know, to prevent the interactions between nematodes and host plants. So how we can do that? I can, you know, explain this in the next slide. Under normal conditions, when the plants are susceptible to nematodes, you have here the nematode effectors secreted in plant cells interact with plant protein, they, and then induce this interaction, change the plant cells to make a permanent feeding site and make the plant susceptible. This is in susceptibility cases. But what we are trying to do, what about our invention is to induce a, like, a mutation use, use uh, genome editing like this for Cas9 to induce like a mutation in one or two amino acids, maybe a little bit more to prevent the interactions as you can see on the right between plant protein and nematode effectors. What happens here, so we'll choose a specific amino acid to prevent the interaction between the nematode effector and the plant protein. But in the same time, we keep the protein as functional. So you prevent the interaction, you sequester the activity of the nematode effector without affecting host or plant protein. And in the same time, to, you'll be able to generate resistance. So what is the broad impact of that? The broad impact of this, that we are using here the tomato as a system, but root not nematode, can infect every single plant, like I said in my introduction. So by generating resistance in tomato, this can be translated to any other crop plants because all of this susceptibility factor 
all of this 118, the majority of them should be conserved in other plant species. So once they approve to produce or to introduce resistance to only one species, in tomato or soybean, you can translate this to any other plant species by easily identifying homolog, because the only one single plant species in the metal species can infect all of them. So their target should be conserved. This is, you know, what is its, it's big deal or of broad uh, impact. Second, by generating this genome editing in one or two amino acids, so this genome editing plants or edited plants by CRISPR-Cas9 so far are considered non-GMO. So by generating this, we can generate like uh, non-transgenic plants, you know, and it can be much easier, you know, to commercialize compared to GMO. Uh, this, you know, this uh, the two major points that I can, you know, talk about it now, considering, you know, the time limitation. And uh, with that, uh, you know, thank you for uh, your attention and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, do we have any qu questions? Yeah, oh. hi, uh, this is Lisa Jennings. I was just wondering, in terms of nematodes, you know, what is the natural predator? And just curious from, a, you know, perhaps, you know, thinking about targets, um, do you have any information in that regard? What do you mean? It's like host? No, the, the predator for nematodes. I mean, uh, if, there were, if there was no genetic manipulation, what, what would be the target? I mean, how do nematodes get cleared, for example? It, it, it's very difficult. Once it's in, in the soil, it's in the field, you cannot get rid of it. We have, for example, this nematode can stay, you know, in, in the soil for up to okay, 30 years. So mm -hmm. there is no you know, uh, known predator so they can feed on the material because it's are not very small, it's like virus or something like that. But there is, you know, there's no wedge. And also there is a problem to, you know, genetically manipulate the method. It's like, it's not like the C. elegance, what is, is, you know, the animal model. So you can, you know, genetically manipulate it very easily. You know, a plant parasitic nematode, including cyst and root knot nematode, it's difficult. You cannot, it's impossible to genetically manipulate it. Thank you. Any other questions? I had a couple questions. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my first question was, uh, I thought you said that um, there was a way to manipulate a few proteins without it being considered non-GMO. Yes. Um, and I was just wondering what are the, um, what, are, what has to be met before it becomes considered GMO? And then my second question was, if you had any concerns about, you know, micro evolution of the nematodes to be able to combat some of these. Okay, this is a very good question. Okay. Uh, for, I forgot the first question. It's about, the, okay, so how to make it, yeah, about GMO. Normally so far, you know, because you don't, this is uh, any crop edited plants, it's DNA free. They don't have like a, a marker. Through, you know, segregation and advancing generation, you can get you can, you can, uh, like edited plants without marker, okay? So it's only having a point mutation that you are looking for. So they are not considered like, like you know, it's a marker free and considered like non-GMO, okay? And in the case that we have like CRISPR-Cas9 can be targeted at a specific region, you know, to manipulate one or two amino acids, change them, preventing the interactions between the nematode and uh, bet between the nematode effector and the plant protein because these are DNA free is considered non-GMO so far. In US, Canada, you know, they are considered non-GMO. The other question, it's about if we are generating that, so how can nematode evolve, you know, to overcome the resistance? 
this is very question, very good question because we realized and we saw that in different plant species like soybean, we have like soybean system method and we have only one major gene that are using for the last 20, 30 years. And suddenly this resistance became susceptible because the evolution of new races or we call this resistant breaking uh, uh, races or biotypes. So okay, the idea of that, if you have only one gene, confirming resistance is very easy for the nematode to evolve and break the resistance. But if you have several genes that are providing resistance, it's very difficult, it takes them very, very long for the nematode you know, to overcome the resistance. This approach is based not only one, our approach is not only to prevent the interaction with only one protein and the method effective. So it should consider to generate more, to combine more point mutation to prevent the interaction with several nematode effector with several plant protein. So it's only not only one gene involved, maybe seven, six, eight, you can stack them together, combine them together in different combinations. So this makes the plant, you know, the resistance, it, it, you know, very effective, very high and durable. This answer your question? Um, yes, it did. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's keep it to just uh, two questions for each speaker. Um, we just have, I know these are all very fascinating presentations and it's a lot of interesting topics, uh, but we have a lot of interesting IP to get through. So let's try to uh, keep things speed up and, and move things along. Um, and I also ask uh, for further presentations, if you can put your uh, questions in the chat, just to make things move along a little faster. Uh, that'll uh, help things move along. I noticed there's also an interesting discussion about the, the technology in the, the chat as well. So please read up on that. Uh, but without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Dietra Mountain. Uh, Dr. Deidre Mountain is an Associate Professor and Scientific Director of Vascular Research at the University of Tennessee Graduate School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Mountain got her BA in Biology and Chemistry from Carson Newman College and her PhD in Biomedical Sciences from East Tennessee State University. She completed postdoctoral work in vascular biology at the University of Tennessee Graduate School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Mountain, please uh, feel free to share your intellectual property. Okay, thank you all for uh, inviting me to talk about our technology. Uh, I know the screen says Brian Mountain. I assure you I am not Brian. <laughs> I am Deidre. Um, let me do the screen share. If you can make me a host or whatever you need to do to allow me to show my PowerPoint slides. You should have it now. Okay. And... And we see your screen. See it? Okay. All right. So our technology surrounds a naturally derived lipid nanoparticle uh, technology with enhanced uh, capabilities for gene therapeutic loading and delivery uh, efficacy. And basically, uh, lipid nanoparticle technology has been the hot topic in uh, many biomedical uh, research laboratories for the last 25 years or so. Uh, lipid nanoparticles are um, basically uh, lipid bilayers that mimic a cell membrane. Um, and oftentimes they are uh, made up of membrane components that are biodegradable lipids that would sometimes be found in a native cell membrane. Um, uh, they're considered biocompatible. Uh, many of the components in the lipid bilayer, <clears throat> such as the lipids, the cholesterol, the uh, stabilizing factors that are incorporated within the bilayer um, are <clears throat> uh, particles and lipids and uh, uh, peptides that would be found naturally in a lipid membrane. Um, the lipid nanoparticles, you, we can control their size by sonication and by um, uh, 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 extrusion 
and create basically create nanoparticles that are less than 100 nanometers so they can avoid uh, res clearance and macrophage clearance and uh, make them very uh, effective passive targeting mechanisms for liver and spleen and tumor angiogenic uh, models uh, because of a lipid bilayer, you can load both hydrophobic or hydrophilic drugs. Uh, hydrophobic drugs can be loaded into the uh, lipid core, um, and then uh, hydrophobic drugs can be loaded um, in within the lipid bilayer itself. In addition to the hydrophilic drugs that can be loaded into the core, nucleic acids, RNA, DNA, uh, plasma DNA, siRNA, uh, messenger RNA, those nucleic acid species um, can be loaded into the core as well. Um, about 15, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, the laboratory started developing uh, second generation lipid nanoparticles where they incorporated these uh, PEG shields on the membrane to improve pharmacokinetics and uh, improved uh, circulation in half time. Uh, in vivo, and then uh, scientists began to use that PEG shield as a mechanism for surface modification to create more targeted uh, liposomes to target specific cell types or tissues, um, and can also uh, alter the membrane of the liposome to, or of the lipid nanoparticle uh, to incorporate antibodies uh, or imaging modalities. <clears throat> so I mentioned that uh, RNA, DNA, and other nucleic acid species can be loaded into uh, the lipid core. Um, this speaks to RNA therapeutics. Uh, RNA therapeutics really do have the potential to revolutionize modern medicine. Um, RNA interference can be used to silence and, uh, or potentiate uh, critical processes that are involved in previously unmanageable uh, diseases such as cancer, uh, vascular diseases and various neurodegenerative uh, diseases, but uh, the success of uh, RNA therapeutics will require a drug delivery system that can encapsulate, retain, and deliver nucleic acid payloads uh, in an efficient manner because those nucleic acid species cannot cross the cell membrane alone uh, and they are subject to nucleic, uh, nucleus degradation. So lipid nanoparticles are the most advanced approaches for RNA delivery uh, in the field of RNA therapeutics. Um, the current state of that technology, uh, not including ours, but the current state of that technology uh, usually will um, uh, incorporate these cationic ionizable lipids in the uh, membrane of the lipid nanoparticle. Um, and that cationic ionizable lipid uh, allows for electrostatic interaction with the anionic cell membrane and then also the anionic uh, nucleic acid species to get more efficient uh, siRNA or RNA or DNA uh, loading into the lipid core and then also to get more efficient um, cell uh, association and delivery. Um, the problem uh, with that uh, current, um, oh, how do I advance? Okay, the problem with that current um, kind of accepted uh, technology is the cationic species uh, of lipids in and of itself. So uh, I mentioned that that cationic uh, ionizable lipid, that's a technology that is um, currently um, clinically approved for a lot of uh, one-off or more acute disease processes, um, but for managing chronic diseases with repeat uh, need for uh, therapeutic administration, um, these cationic liposomes pose a problem because uh, the nature of the cationic lipids that are incorporated into the membrane to allow for more efficient delivery and uh, nucleic acid um, incorporation and uh, encapsulation uh, those lipids in and of themselves are synthetic. And so you just lost all of the biocompatibility uh, and uh, uh, non-toxic advantages of using lipid nanoparticles as your technology by incorporating synthetic lipids into the membrane. Um, so then the question is, why not use uh, natural lipids? Why not use lipids that are uh, <clears throat> commonly found in the cell membrane in and of itself? Um, and the disadvantage of that is you lose, uh, by using the natural lipids, um, you lose that cationic uh, charge, so you lose the electrostatic interaction, 
uh, with both the cell membrane and the nucleic acid. So you have a loss of encapsulation, reduced cellular association. So our uh, goal really was to develop a non-cationic uh, LMP formulation where we could get efficient uh, sRNA encapsulation retention and delivery uh, of our drug payload. So the kind of the state of our technology, we were able to develop a uh, proprietary uh, LMP formulation that um, is patented through uh, UTRF uh, that incorporates only natural phospholipid components in the cell membrane. And so these are lipid species, DOPC, DSPE, DOPE, um, cholesterol, uh, natural components that are highly inert and biocompatible and found in the cell membrane. We uh, incorporated a dually functional peptide into the uh, membrane that is part of the proprietary formulation that is able to both uh, function as a nucleic acid, nucleic acid condenser uh, to enhance drug loading and then also um, potentiate cell membrane permeation uh, and thereby enhancing cellular association and delivery. Uh, our formulation still incorporates this peg shield uh, on the surface, and th so that allows further surface modification for functionalization for cell-specific targeting or, or tissue-specific targeting uh, and also imaging. And as part of this technology, uh, with, through the development of the uh, formulation, we also were able to develop a one-step scalable assembly technique that avoids a lot of the costly lipid synthesis protocols required for uh, kind of the clinical standard uh, up until now, uh, LMP technology, and then also avoids the uh, low pH uh, buffers and some of the other uh, problematic um, techniques that um, uh, kind of interferes with the clinical translatability of common lipid nanoparticles that are in uh, experimental development right now. So both our proprietary LMP formulation and then also the assembly technique that we were able to develop as part of the technology. Um, we were, that assembly technique is a modified ethanol injection technique, which I won't go into the details of that for time's sake, uh, but um, we have done some um, standard nanoparticle characterization uh, analysis and uh, know that uh, we are able to form unilamellar spherical uh, nanoparticles that are less than 100 nanometers using our technique with a relatively neutral uh, uh, membrane charge and, and uh, sRNA encapsulation of about 99%. And so uh, when we took our LMP technology and we tested that technology in vitro, uh, we were able to demonstrate that uh, in a cell culture system, uh, our LMP formulation is significantly less cytotoxic than the current clinical standard LMP formulation. The CLP uh, is our cationic liposome, uh, we'll call it the clinical standard uh, uh, cationic um, positive control, I guess, uh, in our studies. And so you can see that our uh, nanoparticle formulation is significantly less cytotoxic than the, than the current, current clinical standard. Um, when we looked at uh, in vitro cellular association, uh, we were able to demonstrate significant so cellular association in vitro as well. I mentioned that we were able to uh, achieve uh, very um, high sRNA encapsulation efficiency numbers at around 99%. Uh, and we looked at nucleus protection uh, the siRNA that was encapsulated and retained within our liposome technology uh, was very, very high. And we were able to demonstrate significant uh, targeted gene silencing in vitro using uh, our LMP uh, formulation as well. Um, some of the more exciting uh, and more recent advances with this technology um, we, because the ultimate goal is we want to be able to take these lipid nanoparticles uh, into clinical translation. But before you can do that, obviously you have to show uh, ex vivo and in vivo efficiency. Um, and so to do this, we took uh, we looked at a human vascular model. We 
Uh, this system here is an ex vivo perfusion system. We were able to take uh, human vascular explants from ampu amputated limbs um, from the OR, OR at UT Medical Center. We bring those uh, vascular explants to a research lab and keep them viable in this uh, vascular perfusion system here on the, on the uh, left hand side of the screen. Um, and within this system, this allows us to perfuse our LMP technology um, at physiological conditions through uh, the vessel that's cannulated within the system. And we were able to uh, demonstrate that in um, human vascular tissue, our LMP technology has very efficient uh, binding affinity for human vascular tissue ex vivo. Um, and under uh, uh, physiological perfusion, perfusion conditions. And then um, more recently, even using a rodent in vivo perfusion model, uh, we were able to demonstrate that our LMP technology, uh, when we delivered that LMP technology via endovascular infusion in a rodent model, we got very efficient bonding um, in the carotid vessel. Uh, let me move this here. We get very efficient bonding in the carotid vessel <clears throat> of our rodent model, uh, their vascular targeted um, LMP technology versus their sham control. So that's the current state of our lipid nanoparticle. Uh, we're currently working to uh, further develop the nanoparticle um, for more tissue specific targeting by altering the surface of our base liposome formulation uh, using uh, different peptides and antibody fragments. Um, and then uh, also currently ongoing our pharmacokinetic and biodistribution studies <clears throat> to look at uh, clearance of the nanoparticle through the system uh, on um, uh, uh, using it as an injectable therapeutic, uh, basically, instead of an endovascular infusion. So I'd be glad to take questions or address questions in the chat for time's sake. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Madden. Uh, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat already. If you go okay. ahead and answer them in person, uh, I just figured we'd throw the questions in the chat, but uh, yeah, please uh, answer them uh, out loud if, if you're... Um, can you see the questions or would you like me to read them out? Um, I just took off the screen share so I can look at them. Um, yeah, okay, so they are uniform. We can control size. Um, we actually have a very uh, narrow PDI or homogeneity uh, of each of our uh, liposomes. So anything below a 2.0, I'm sorry, a, a 0.2 PDI um, is considered uh, very clinically translatable. Uh, using our um, assembly technique, we are able to achieve around a 0.1 PDI. And so they are very homogeneous uh, in population. Um, and the size, uh, because we've been able to hone in a little bit closer on our injection parameters, um, looking at uh, flow rate and then also vortex speed and that sort of thing, and uh, uh, using some microfluidic uh, technology, uh, our size is between uh, 70 and 80 nanometers. And so <clears throat> we are able to control size. Actually, that's even without extrusion. That's just... Uh, um, uh, our, assembly, our modified ethanol injection technique is able to achieve a size uh, and um, uh, unilamellar uh, morphology without extrusion. With extrusion, uh, we are able to bring our PDI down to about 0.1. Um, would the HUS immune system look at the particles of foreign antigen or trigger immune response? So no, that's the advantage of app. So the current clinical standard cationic ionizable LMP formulations, absolutely yes. That's why those LMP formulations are not currently clinically uh, approved for use for chronic conditions that you can use them for a vaccine for, uh, you know, um, uh, not, uh, but not long-term chronic conditions. They're not, uh, not approved for use for long-term chronic conditions such as vascular disease, neurogen uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, tumor angiogenesis, that sort of thing. Um, so the advantage of our technology is because they are uh, completely, uh, the, the uh, lipid bilayer 
is formed completely uh, with natural lipid constituents and no synthetic uh, lipid species at all. Um, they do not, they should not, I can't definitively say that obviously, but they should not trigger an immune response um, that you see with the current uh, clinically approved nanodrugs on the market. Um, bloated variety of things, biodegradable. Let's see, I'm reading Chad's thing right now. That looks like a very good summary and not a question. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think there's one last question from Andy if you want to answer that or- oh, if you Let me go, okay, no, we have some yeah. more done here, yep. Test is some vascular tissue. Um, so no other tissue has currently been tested other than vascular tissue. And yes, we do have plans for other tissues. Um, connective tissue, uh, we have not looked at any type of connective tissue in, uh, models. We have some plans for uh, tumor models, obviously, and vaccine development um, are in the works, but so, for, I don't remember if this was actually mentioned in my introduction or not, but I actually run the vascular research lab. So we, that the very first slide that was on there about the entrepreneur uh, jumping off a cliff and building an airplane later, my, I, I am a vascular biologist by training. I am not a biomedical engineer and I am not uh, a nanoparticle scientist at all. So our lab kind of took this jump four years ago um, when we had all of these mechanisms of vascular disease that we knew were important for uh, inhibiting hyperplasia and improving surgical outcomes. And then we thought, okay, how are we going to do this? Because we don't really care about knockout mice. You can't do that in a human. We're very clinically uh, uh, oriented. We're very closely tied to a clinical uh, lab or very closely tied to a clinical department. And so we wanted to figure out a way that we could that we could look at those mechanisms and prove their importance and 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 also, um, affect their, the signaling mechanisms to actually improve surgical outcomes in a way that could eventually be translated to a human. And so we kind of jumped off that cliff four years ago into nanoparticle development, and it's been a wild ride. But um, I say that to say our lab's focus is vascular disease. And so that obviously is why that was the first tissue type that we tested our nanoparticle in. But we do have uh, collaborating uh, investigators who are very, very interested in the technology and interested in developing it for their own uh, research uh, uh, programs as well. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mann. Sure. I'll uh, go ahead and uh, move things along and introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Wellington Machera. Dr. Wangs Machera is a quantitative geneticist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and holds joint faculty appointments in the Plant Sciences Department, the Bredesen Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Graduate Education at the University of Tennessee, as well as the Oak Ridge Institute. Dr. Machera's research involves cross-kingdom gen genomics to understand shared mechanisms underlying cancer signaling in humans and disease resistance in plants. He hosts... Um, he holds a BSc in crop sciences from Cal Poly Pomona and a PhD in plant pathology from the University of California, Riverside. But without further ado, uh, Dr. Majera. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Awesome, great. And I'm, I'm really excited and I'm thankful for the first two speakers because they pretty much laid the foundation for the challenges that I'm going to be presenting today and challenges that I my group works to hopefully provide some solutions towards. Again, the issue of human health is one that we cannot understate and it's uh, uh, widely documented. We are all familiar with this, even on a personal level, especially when we are talking about cancer uh, and, and you know, cancer prevalence. prevalence uh, and this is a problem worldwide. Here, just kind of like the, uh, it's the, the brief summary of the actual economic cost for what cancer uh, uh, problems cause across the, uh, the globe, you know, ranging into the trillions of dollars. So this is not a trivial issue. And then the second one that uh, Tarek uh, did a really good job of also illustrating was the problem that we face with uh, plant pathogens and how that affect not only food production, but all the plant-based industries uh, that we all depend on. And so this is kind of like an 
ongoing problem that we can never find solutions, permanent solutions to. And so innovation has to keep going at every pace. And, and so again, a human health and uh, uh, plant disease, some people may wonder, well, what, what does that have to do with each other? What's the commonality between those two problems and how can we find a solution that claims to uh, possibly help in, in both those categories? And I think the answer is actually was provided in the previous uh, uh, technologies as well, where most of, most of the underlying uh, causes of these human, human, uh, human disease, cancers, plant disease, we know there's genetic mechanisms behind them. So there's a shared uh, uh, sort of like uh, theme where genetics underlies most of the diseases, cancer progression, which is why nowadays you can get your DNA tested and a company can predict what cancers you're most likely you know, to suffer from based on your lifestyle and things like that. That is because most of that stuff is encoded in our DNA. Likewise, in plants, we know there are resistance mechanisms against uh, these pathogens. Plants also evolve to fight off uh, pathogens, and those have been well documented in plant pathology studies. The unique approach that we take in my, in my group is we recognize that as much and as unlikely as it seems, plants and humans are actually not that different uh, in terms of the genetics. And so we, we take this approach where we use cross kingdom studies to identify genetic mechanisms that are conserved in their function between highly divergent organisms. And here is just an illustrative examples of the genomes that we are able to look and you can see our plants are way over here and our animals where we belong as humans are also way over there. But in terms of genetic distance, we are actually not that far. So what this provides us is, is provides an opportunity for us to get really refined understanding of genes and proteins that might underlie shared function that could then provide solutions uh, to the problems that we are facing. And that's exactly what we did. And I show you here, this is kind of the, the hallmark feature of our technology where we found this single protein domain that's found in both plants and animals. And it's found in all, all kinds of other organisms as well. And the one key feature that we, are, we were able to tell when we found that protein domain was all proteins that carry this domain were involved in immune signaling somehow whether it was in plant uh, signaling or in human signaling. And here I just saw kind of give you an example where we fall, if we were to align that domain and look at how conserved it is across organisms. So this is humans, uh, uh, homo sapiens, this is where we are. An example with maize, maize plant. So aligning a human sequence to a maize sequence, what you can see is they are really core conserved amino acids uh, that are shared between all these organisms. And what we were able then to demonstrate is to actually show that we could mutate one or all four of these uh, mutations and completely change signaling properties that happen in plants and in humans. And for the human side, what we, uh, the pathway that we targeted was this, uh, is the CMET HGF pathway. This pathway is notorious for uh, regulating cancer, uh, cancer, cancerous cell progression. As you can see, I list a number of cancers that have been implicated by the misregulation of this one pathway. And here again at the bottom, you can see another, ex you know, another list where on this side of the pathway, all these are the cancers that's, that are also caused uh, uh, by this particular pathway. And our invention was actually demonstrating that we could mutate that one amino acid or four amino acids at this stage of the, of the signaling of this signaling pathway, and we could shut down the whole thing. So, this pathway is responsible for uh, cell migration and invasion. It's responsible for cell survival. And these are things that you do not want uh, tumorous uh, cells to, to be able to do. You don't want your, 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 your cancerous cells to uh, 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 proliferate. You want to stop them from, uh, from the cell cycle from happening. So what we were demonstrating was we could mutate one single amino acid and we could completely stop all these downstream processes. So none of this happens when we target that one particular protein domain. And as such, we don't get cell proliferation that's associated with all these kinds of cancers uh, here. And where we demonstrate with the stop signs is where we have actual scientific evidence that we have shown that that process is completely stop, uh, stopped. And for the sake of time, I did not uh, include all those slides in this, but if you are curious about the actual 
hardcore science that's behind what we were doing here, I'll be happy to share, you know, in, a, in, a, in another venue. But you can clearly see that all the key processes that are involved in, uh, in cancer progression are completely shut down. So here we are not only reducing activity, we are completely stopping the activity. And as a comparison, the, uh, most of the drugs that are being de uh, de uh, designed right now tend to target this particular protein here, which is the, uh, the, the receptor uh, uh, part of the signaling pathway. And there have been multiple drugs that have gone under FDA you know, evaluation. Most of them don't make it you know, in terms of approval because of toxicity. And some of them are just too big uh, to be able to be eff efficient. So in our case, we are only targeting a single amino acid we could either, in humans, we cannot mutate it, but we can just target it by uh, 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 you know, sub substrates that block the activity of that amino acid and none of this happens. So this is in humans where we can target that domain and stop uh, cell proliferation and cancer progression. And then in plants, we adopted again, the exact same mechanism where, like I say, plants also have signaling cascades in terms of immune signaling. And we recognized also that that domain was involved in Im immune signaling in key defense pathways in plants. And again, what we were able to demonstrate was we could target one of those residue, of those conserved residues uh, in these receptors. These are membrane, these are receptors that lie on the plant cell wall or the plant cell uh, membrane rather. And what they do is they're able to perceive presence of a pathogen uh, on the ex extracellular uh, matrix of the cell and then initiate signaling cascades that say, you know, you're under attack, you need to initiate a defense response right now. And what we could show was we could manipulate that protein domain again, and then artificially, or at least induce activity of this uh, signaling cascade. And all of these are defense genes that are associated with uh, plant immune responses. And so when a, pathogen, when a plant is under pathogen response, you want all these downstream genes to be upregulated. That means now the plant is able to defend itself. And the consequence of that upregulation of those genes is actually that you get the jasmonic acid and jasmonic acid related hormone, homo, hormones that, that are produced. And these are defense signaling hormones that then again trigger defense cascades where the plant now can create additional cell walls to wall off wounds. They cause hypersensitive responses to kill off cells just to make sure that the pathogen does not progress. Uh, beyond uh, beyond local infections. So two examples, one in hu human cancers, one in plants, where we are targeting the exact same pro protein domain, the exact same amino acid, and we get the favorable outcomes to fight some of these challenges that we are facing. Again, if you're interested on the plant side in the, the scientific details be, be, uh, uh, behind this slide that I'm showing, I'll, I'll be happy to share in, uh, in, in a separate uh, uh, platform. And so if you have any questions, these are the contacts that you can reach out to. You can reach out to myself or our commercialization manager at Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't see any questions in the chat yet. Um, if there are any questions uh, anybody has, you can speak them loud at this stage as well. All right, uh, if there are no questions, in that case, I'll move on to the, uh, uh, the next uh, intellectual property. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Joel Bumgardner. Dr. Joel Bumgardner currently serves as the chair of the biomedical engineering department here at the University of Memphis. Uh, he obtained his bachelor of science degree in biology from Florida State University and a bachelor of state in material science, a master's and a doctorate in biomedical engineering all from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. Mark Gardner has been a faculty at Mississippi State University and a professor and co-director of academic programs in the biomedical engineering department at the University of Memphis and in the University of Memphis, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis Joint Graduate Biomedical Engineering Program. His area of research is in dental, craniofacial, and orthopedic alloys and corrosion in chitosan-based materials for implant coating, bone tissue engineering, and de drug delivery. Dr. Mark Gardner. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, if you can share the screen for me. And are people seeing the slides? 
not quite yet. It's taking a moment. Yeah. You are sharing screen. There we go. Yeah, now we see it. Now All we see right. it. Perfect. So thank you very much for a very nice introduction. So um, my uh, technology is a little bit different from some of the previous ones. So we'll have a little bit of a change of pace here. Um, <clears throat> and I always like to start off these talks with saying that uh, um, oral health is one of the major indicators of overall health and well being. Um, and you don't have to brush all your teeth, only the ones you want to keep. And obviously, uh, many people around the world, and America in particular, don't brush and floss their teeth as much as they probably should. Periodontal disease is quite prevalent in the, uh, in the world. Approximately 50% of the adults uh, suffer from some degree of periodontal disease. The problem is uh, uh, when uh, the disease, the disease is an inflammatory disease, and when it progresses to a very significant effect, uh, it causes loss of bone mass, and then this leads to loss of your dentition. Loss of dentition then has a great effect on um, not only your health, but also on your socio uh, um, uh, um, aspects because uh, it can be a very um, uh, embarrassing and, and limit your social interactions. Um, cleverly, the dentists have come up with a very good technology, dental implants, to help treat the loss of natural dentition. Um, dental implants are a uh, huge and widely used dental implant therapy. They're very, very successful. Um, and they work quite well. The issue is that, and I saw some, um, is that uh, to, for the dental implants to be functional, they need to have um, sufficient bone mass. And so we need to regrow this lost bone that occurred due to the inflammatory disease to regrow the bone to be able to accommodate a dental implant. Um, so the dentists have come up with a strategy called guided bone regeneration. And the way it works is here, you have a, a bone defect, you've lost a tooth and you've lost bone mass. They put in the bone graft material, then they cover it with a membrane. And the reason why they cover it with a membrane is that your bone takes a little bit longer time to heal and regenerate than the gingival tissues. Uh, the gingival tissues uh, tend to grow a bit much faster. And if that membrane's not there, they'll grow into the defect site and you uh, won't grow as much bone. And this will require subsequent uh, uh, dental interventions. Uh, here you can see a clinical uh, uh, images, uh, x-rays. So this is a person you can see in these radiolucent zones severe bone resorption around this tooth. Um, they put in around bone graft. Here you can see part of a membrane that has been implanted around this tooth. And in about six months, what we can see is that the bone has regrown around this tooth. And we'll make the distinction that when you're saving a tooth, it's called guided tissue regeneration. When you're just regrowing bone for dental implant therapies, it's called bone regeneration. Um, these things can also be used for a variety of craniofacial injuries, uh, particularly blast injuries that can occur by our military personnel who have been serving in a various um, uh, conflict zones. And of course, we have a pending conflict zone coming up potentially in Ukraine, uh, hopefully not. Uh, this can also be applied to orthopedic uh, injuries these include uh, injuries, you know, automobile accidents, industry accidents, natural disasters, as well as bone cancer, where large segments of the bone are lost and we need to fill this space in. And again, we want to put the bone graft in here to regrow the bone, but minimize the invasion of the soft tissues. There are many devices out there that are currently used for guided bone regeneration. Uh, one of them are 
uh, one of the most, uh, the original devices were made out of Teflon, um, also known as polytetrafluoroethylene. Um, it's a nice material, has great uh, space saving capabilities, but it is a non-degradable material. So it requires a second surgical intervention to remove. Um, this could disrupt the healing tissues and cause additional um, um, problems in uh, follow-up therapies. They switched to several uh, degradable materials, including collagen, and these polylactic acid, polyglycolic acid membranes. Collagen is very nice. Your body is made up of a lot of collagen. It's degradable. It's very good for supporting uh, cells and tissue uh, healing. But the problem is that these uh, membranes can become exposed. They get exposed, they get bacterial infection. Uh, bacteria will cause premature degradation of these membranes. And then you've got soft tissue invading the space. And again, you're back to having to do additional interventions. Um, this picture down here is showing you where a membrane has degraded prematurely and the soft tissue you can see is invading into the space where we're trying to regrow new bone. Um, in addition, these things also are, uh, can become infected by oral pathogens that can also further delay the healing. In addition, uh, the polylactic acid membranes uh, have similar complications, but in addition, they can also impede healing because they degrade into acidic degradation products, lactic acid, glycolic acid, and that can cause additional inflammation uh, issues. So some of our work has been looking at this uh, natural polymer called chitazan. Chitazan is a historical name, but it is really a polysaccharide made of N-acetylglucosamine, uh, N-acetylglucosamine and glucosamine. Uh, these polysaccharides are very prevalent in your body, uh, form part of your natural extracellular matrix. They're degradable, compatible. They're also widely used uh, and investigated for drug delivery applications. They degrade into simple oligosaccharides or sugars that are non-acidic. And uh, this polymer can have a controllable degradation based on how we manipulate the number of uh, uh, N-acetyl glucosamine units in the polymer. Uh, we can make these uh, membranes into what we call nanofibers. And the reason why we would like to make them into these nanofibers is that um, these, they have a large surface area that's good for drug loading. So we could add, say, for example, antibiotics or other growth factors or pro-healing factors to the membranes to help with the healing process. Uh, these nanofibers mimic the natural extracellular matrix of your extracellular tissues composed of collagen, and this is very nice for the cells to attach and grow on. And because of these fibers, they're kind of like a non-woven thing. They make these porous structures, which are nice because the structures allow for exchange of nutrients and um, signals between the soft tissue and the bone healing compartments, which is important for healing, but they're very small or circuitous that prevent the cells from migrating through the membranes and invading space. So they still maintain their excellent barrier function. One of the most common ways that people do this to make these nanofibers is an electrospinning process. And basically you're putting the chitosan solution uh, into, uh, uh, putting it into a solution. You're putting a large uh, voltage gradient on it that causes the polymer to be pulled out along the voltage gradient and we can collect it on this surface. Uh, so far, so good, everything's great. But one of the problems is that when they spin these things, the fibers, when they get exposed to an aqueous environment like PBS, uh, saline, things like that, uh, these fibers swell. So now you've spent all this time to make all these nice nanofibers, but only to lose the nanofibers when you put them in the body. And so that's, uh, you lose a lot of those nice characteristics of the membranes that you have worked so hard to, to generate. So our technology has been a, a method to modify the membranes post spinning to help restore, maintain and, uh, this nanofiber structure. 
And here, what you can see is this is an s -bum membrane that we've treated with our process. Uh, we've recently got a patent on it. We uh, basically are using uh, small fatty acid molecules uh, on the surface of our structure. Uh, here, this is about two weeks after sitting in a simple saline solution at room temperature. And we can see that we still maintain a nice nanofiber structure. Um, what you see here is some cell culture work. The cells attach and grow on it just fine. Um, down here, we've compared the mechanical properties. Um, these things, when they're implanted, they're often used these small metallic tacks to hold them in place. And we don't do quite as well as our collagen uh, membranes, but we do do better than our PLA, PGA uh, type membranes in their ability to be attacked and secured in place. We do see that they are degradable and they do degrade on a time frame that is appropriate for clinical applications. We've done a variety of small animal uh, rodent models. Uh, we used a rat calvarial defect. We made a defect, implanted some bone graft and covered it with our membranes. Uh, and here we actually have two processes, but we'll focus in on this butyral process. Uh, here you can see the membrane after about four weeks. And what's really cool is that you can see the bone forming in and along the membrane. The membrane is guiding the bone formation. These uh, darker spots are the bone graft material. Down here, you see the collagen membrane. Uh, you see the same thing, but the collagen doesn't quite guide the bone following along the membrane. Most of the bone is coming in from the edge of the defects and filling into the uh, structure. So uh, what we've been able to achieve so far is that we've been able to show that we can electrospin this very nice material into the um, uh, nanofiber structure. We can modify it to retain this nanofiber structure. We've got good mechanical handability for use by the dental clinicians. Um, we've got good compatibility uh, results, appropriate degradation. We're able to maintain barrier function and the barrier function at least is on par with that of collagen membranes, but we are seeing some benefit on the early healing of these membranes. Uh, future work is gonna be uh, potentially look at uh, adding different uh, therapeutic agents to the membranes to further enhance their uh, growth, um, uh, uh, or ability to support the growth and the healing of the bone. Um, there've been lots of people involved on this work. Um, I will mention that this started off about five, six years ago through a grant, small grant through the FedEx Institute of Technology. We had some collaborators in China who helped with us on this. The work was further supported by a grant from the DOD and then through NIH. Um, so thank you very much. And remember, brush and floss your teeth and oral health is very important. Thank you very much, Doctor. I uh, appreciate the advice. Um, any questions? I'm not sure. I, uh, there's a question in the chat if you can see it. Or yes, I see one. It's asked about, it asked about uh, advantageous over 3D printed membranes. Uh, to my knowledge, 3D printed membranes cannot be printed to a nano scale. Um, uh, most of the 3D printing that I know about, uh, we're at micron scale dimensions. And so, again, if you think about your native extracellular matrix, you're trying to recapitulate that, um, getting down to this nanofiber scale is, is, is very adva advantageous and important. Um, it's a very simple process. It's easily scalable. Um, okay. So uh, the nano surface provides additional surface area for uh, drug loading, should we want to pursue that. I was thinking about Dr. Bolin's research. Has he only gone down to the micro scale? Uh, no, he also does electrospinning. Uh, he is looking at some different matrices um, for, for, for his stuff and slightly different applications. Um, but he is not uh, 3D printing. He is also electrospinning uh, his matrices. Somebody asked me, it says, would it cost more? Actually, no, because it's a, a, the setup for electrospinning is very economical. And um, 
I will say that Kaizen is a, um, the nice thing about this, we'll tie back into some of our ag friends down there. So this is a, uh, the source of Kaizen, uh, most of it comes from shellfish waste. There are other sources to get the Kaizen polymer, but there is a huge amount of shellfish waste in the world. And so it just accumulates. Um, and so we are taking a waste product and making it into a value added commodity. So that's another nice advantage of using this material. When are you be able to bleach an implant after the graft? Uh, when will we be able to? So this is place, oh, after the graft. So actually they, uh, the dentists have kind of two processes. So they would um, put the bone graft in, cover it with the membrane, allow the bone to regrow. And that can take anywhere from three to six months or potentially longer, depending on the age of the patient. And then they could come back in and do the subsequent implant therapy. Um, if you're younger, you don't have too much bone loss. Uh, sometimes they'll put the implant in at the same time as the graft and use the membrane at the same time. Um, but the, really, that's a clinician strategy, and it does depend on uh, the severity of bone loss, uh, age of the patient, and some other factors. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 let's move on to our next uh, speaker. We actually have a, a shift in the schedule. We have one more uh, presenter from UTK. So everybody, uh, you'll have your, uh, your presentations uh, after that. So our next speaker is Dr. Scott Lenehan. Yes. Uh, Scott Lenihan is an assistant yeah, professor right. at the Department of Food Science uh, in a position at the Mechanical, Aerospace, and Biomedical Engineering Department. His research expertise covers engineering biological systems, biomaterials, and devices that utilize cutting-edge synthetic biology tools and approaches. Dr. Lenihan, uh, go ahead. Uh, can I share screen? Yes, to your co-host. Let me see your screen. You guys see it? All right, so I'm gonna talk actually on uh, engineering application for uh, engineering plants. I'm talking today about a technology we developed that we call mini plastomes. That's for plastid engineering in plants. So I'm sure most of you are familiar and Tarek uh, did a good job early on of explaining some of how you get uh, GMO plants. So this is another strategy. Typically with GMO plants, you're transforming and engineering the nucleus of the plant. Uh, the technology here uh, is focused on plastic engineering, which has its own advantages that I can talk about. Just for a general landscape for synthetic biology and, and agriculture, currently people are focusing mostly on CRISPR stuff, uh, synthetic promoters, transcription factors, and parts-based assembly. The emerging technologies are more focused on engineering systems for automation, robotics, uh, changing throughput, uh, crops used for synthetic circuits. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, synthetic genomes and subgenomes. So we got our, we, we borrowed our, we're Bible inspired, essentially our technology out of diatoms. So diatoms have a, have a plastid organization that's composed of a bunch of small subunits rather than one large subunit. So in typical plant chloroplasts, they're composed of one large uh, DNA molecule, a circular molecule. And that contains all the genes that are expressed within the plastic compartment. So using a, a similar strategy that, that was uh, derived from diatoms, we built our, our technology from that, that type of base. So this is the way that the, the state of the art functions in the top in A on the top, you can see how chloroplasts are typically transformed. The, the base structure is that you have a donor vector and the, the circular genome. You insert your genes by actually integrating or through homologous recombination, you're basically plugging your genes into the native chloroplast genome. So in that case, you do get the problems that Tarek talked about with uh, marker gene insertion. You have to go through multiple cycles. Uh, for those of you that don't work with plants, plants are incredibly slow. So going through mul multiple tissue, cy tissue cycles in plants is extremely laborious. Uh, so our technology, if you look at A on the bottom, is rather than using uh, homologous recombination to insert genes into the, into the native chloroplast genome, what we're doing is providing a, a basically a supplemental uh, plasmid. That plasmid is capable of 
uh, replicating and growing on its own. And then you can express your transgenes off the, off the plasmid itself. And we're calling those plasmids mini symplasmids. So these are, these are basically circular plasmids that are self-replicating in chloroplasts. They won't necessarily replicate in bacteria or wherever they're, they're cloned into based on design. And that's the real, the, the crux of the technology is enabling that uh, transgene expression without insertion into the native chloroplast genome. This is one way, and I'll talk about it in a second, but this is one way to look at avoiding some regulatory hurdles while also speeding the transition to get something that's commercially viable. So technique wise, the approach uses a, a similar approach to traditional chloroplast engineering where you, you fire ballistics through the gene gun into plant tissue. You then regenerate that tissue back. And in our case, we followed the technology all the way through. And then we're able to pull the technology back out in the, in the end through multiple, uh, multiple life generations. Uh, you can see on this slide, so we've done multiple uh, analysis of vegetative and propagative stages and demonstrated that these are potato, that in the potato lines that we deployed the strategy in, you, there's no difference in phenotype from the potato lines that you're getting for the most part. So your tuber yield is the same. Your above ground biomass is the same. So if you were to deploy this technology in potato for this example, you're you're not you're not altering altering the the structure of the plant itself. You're not altering the yield of what you actually care about, which would be the food for this particular crop. You're just introducing a sort of a, an accessory that the plant can passage through time and and use to generate a product of interest would be the what we pitch it for. Uh, you can see on this slide, so in updated uh, IP, we've generated marker-free lines for this. So again, this would be a strategy where we can, in one transformation step, remove any kind of marker genes, and then that gets around the, the any kind of regulatory concerns that you would have with uh, nuclear engineering. So in this case, um, you could do a one-step transformation. You could put in, let's say, a, a metabolic pathway, and you would be able to get around the use of bacterial pathogens to insert your DNA, and that can get you much faster to commercialization. Uh, I should also say that with the chloroplast engineering technology, just in general, and ours is uh, no different, you get much higher expression of heterologous proteins. So if you were making, let's say, vaccine molecules in planta or a COVID vaccine, which has been done, you're getting much higher yield than you would through traditional uh, plant engineering technologies. Uh, commercialization targets, uh, biopharma. So like I said, you can use uh, chloroplast engineering to produce extremely high value compounds such as biopharma molecules, uh, drug compounds, uh, antibodies, um, and even vaccine molecules. Uh, in the big ag sector, this is basically a, a type of plant engineering. So you could use this to you know, in, decrease your disease resistance. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what the trait is that you're trying to install. You could use this type of technology to, to install that type of trait within your plant system. And again, this, this is agnostic to the, to the plant itself. Uh, the other area is niche plant markets. So we get hit up all the time for making bioluminescent plants. I don't know why people like bioluminescent plants. But again, this kind of technology, and we have deployed this type of technology to make bioluminescent plants. So there's, if you think about the glowfish, so if you have uh, this type of technology, which is inherently uh, bioconfined, so chloroplasts are not passed in pollen, so you have a natural bioconfinement through any chloroplast engineering, uh, that again also helps with the regulatory landscape. So basically, the this, the quick summary is that it's a new plant engineering technology, specifically in the chloroplast for introduction of traits, where you can get high value compounds, uh, up to 40% uh, total dry weight of heterologous protein in the leaves. Uh, there's a variety of markets, but this is basically a transformative technology, especially with regards to traditional chloroplast engineering. I think that pretty much hits my time. So. I can answer any questions. Do you have any questions? Feel free to speak my blood or, or put them in the chat if you have any.
Well, if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lanahan. Uh, I'll go ahead and move on to our next intellectual property. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Wei Li. Uh, Dr. Li is currently a distinguished professor at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and director of the UTHC College of Pharmacy Drug Discovery Center. Um, and the faculty director of the Shared Analytic Instrument Facility at UTCFP. He is also the founder and CSO of Seek Therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Li obtained his bachelor's degree from the University of Science and Technology in China and his PhD from Columbia University, both in chemistry. His research focus is small molecule drug discovery. Dr. Li, uh, go ahead. Yes, so thank you very much for the nice introduction. And uh, where, let me see if I can share my slide. Uh, so. Okay, I think that should be good. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I want to thank um, UTIF, my colleague at UTIF, James, and uh, the um, other colleagues in this panel to give me this opportunity to share our technology. And hopefully I can get some feedback and uh, even get some help for the preparation for my future SBIR grant. <clears throat> so um, we are chemistry lab, uh, so we do drug discovery and uh, the technology that we are working on or I'm sharing with you today is a um, selective ion channel inhibitor that uh, can be potentially developed into a targeted therapy for epilepsy. So uh, epilepsy, just a very brief uh, discussion. So epilepsy is a chronic um, neurological disorder and is characterized by recurrent unprovoked seizures. Uh, the seizure is a sudden surge of elect electrical activity in the brain, and it is actually the fourth most common neurological disease uh, after migraine, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. It affects a lot of people, uh, about one to two percent of all populations in different age groups. And uh, so that's about over three million people in the US suffer from C uh, epilepsy. Globally, it's about 65 million people. And the uh, drug market for epilepsy is about $5 billion a year, uh, but the annual cost in the US alone related to epilepsy management is estimated at about $15 billion. So it's a big market. Uh, as you can imagine, so it's a big market. There's also a lot of drugs that have been approved for epilepsy treatment. Uh, so the drug typically is called anti-seizure medicines or ASM. They have very, they have a diverse uh, mechanisms as we summarized here from the literature, but a lot of them are targeting the ion channels, including the potassium channel or sodium channel or uh, calcium channels. So we have a lot of drugs and uh, what are the issues, what are the problems, what is the unmet medical need. First, they about one third of epilepsy patients, they are not responding to these existing drugs. So they are drug resistant and they really receive no benefit from these existing drugs. And also about 80% of the epilepsy patient who take ASMs experience uh, adverse effects. Um, another one is that the current drugs uh, really try to reduce the symptoms and they do not have disease modifying effects. So therefore there's uh, always some new, uh, uh, there's always a need to develop new drugs that could either prevent the uh, development of epilepsy or have disease modifying effects or have less harmful side effects. So <clears throat> this is where we try to uh, work on this area. Um, so six therapeutics uh, is formed in about a little bit over three years ago. Uh, so it currently has a two pipeline uh, uh, preclinical products 
development, not product preclinical, I guess, um, uh, compound. One that it's a uh, um, targeted the drug potentially for pediatric cancer, and the other one is really the uh, um, develop a selective trips three ion channel inhibitor that uh, originally invented in my lab, and we have been working with biologists in UT um, College of Pharmacy and College of Medicine for a lot of biological studies. So the lead compound uh, is called uh, CYK85, and uh, this is the molecule in the CPK uh, model. Um, and it's recently patented by UTRF uh, last year. Now, the, uh, some of the properties of CYK85 is that it's uh, compared with the existing drugs for uh, epilepsy, it targeted a new drug target that is a TRPT3 ion channel that has not been targeted before uh, or by using the current um, drugs. And this is the uh, drug show the ion channel. And uh, it's, we have uh, done extensive biological studies to show that the CYK85 directly interact with uh, TRPT3 with this drug target. Uh, so it has on target uh, binding and it has good brain penetration uh, because we are developing a CNS drug. So we want to make sure that this compound is really can penetrate to the brain and uh, cross the BBB and accumulate to the in the brain. Uh, the animal study we have done uh, showing that the brain to plasma concentration of the drug is about 30%. In other words, uh, it has a significant amount of the drug go to the brain. And uh, in animal studies, uh, that is done by my colleague, Dr. Jian Xiong um, Jiang, he has using two, he had used the two animal models uh, showing that the uh, compound are effective in reducing the acute seizures. Uh, so suggesting that uh, this effect may not be model dependent, but we're still going to expand the study with additional models to really uh, demonstrate that it's not model dependent. And also uh, when we compare with a standard of care drug for seizure, we demonstrated that our compound is actually having better efficacy than this uh, standard of care drug in the uh, uh, mass model. So um, it's promising. Um, so the current stage, uh, we're still trying to Demonstrate. Uh, oh yeah. So as, as I just discussed uh, uh, in, a, uh, in the previous slides, we have demonstrated it on target interaction and uh, has the target selectivity, has reasonable pharmacokinetic profile and uh, good brain penetration and uh, in vivo efficacy for uh, epilepsy. Uh, we have a uh, also obtained an academic grant recently to try to develop this compound further and uh, develop its backups. Uh, we, uh, actually, we are actually pursue uh, non-dilutive uh, non uh, SBR grant uh, and uh, with the goal to ultimately to obtain a phase two grant to perform the uh, IND enabling studies so that it can be get, you know, can get ready for, uh, for the first in-human trial and then hopefully to uh, license out uh, and exit at that point. In terms of the uh, uh, IP, we uh, uh, work with, it, with UTIF and UTIF has uh, filed a non-provisional patent application uh, late last year. So to protecting the competition matter uh, of the uh, compound and uh, the various use in the different diseases. Uh, we are still actually working on making derivatives and uh, trying to find uh, other related analogs in this scaffold to have backup compound and therefore future patent application will incorporate additional compositional matter for the new compound and uh, also if there's uh, uh, application for this compound in other diseases so for example the literature in the literature there indication that TRPT3 is involved in cardiovascular disease. So we could expand the application to those areas. Uh, and the six therapeutics plans to license this IP from UTIF in the near future. 
So that's uh, that's a quick rundown for this. So this is the first time I uh, participate in this uh, platform. So I don't really know uh, what exactly that needs to be presented, but I I, I, I just try to give a little bit of idea what uh, we are doing. And I thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and the platform. I would like to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. That's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, Ryan Hughes has a, a question in the chat. Can you see? Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, do you know how the compound bind to the target in the active site? Do you have a structure with the drug bond complex? Yes, this is a great question and we are, we are trying to work on. So uh, all we know right now is that the compound directly binds the uh, tube C3 protein. Now, how it binds, we don't know. Uh, we, uh, the uh, tube C3 has a crowd EM structure, but it's no ligand. Uh, bound to the primers, it's, it has only has the uh, what do we call the apo structure. So we are working with our colleagues, uh, our collaborators, try to get the crow EM structure of the compound in complex with trypsy three. So hopefully we can get that uh, to answer this question. But this is a this is a very critical question. Thank you. Any further questions for Dr. Lee? If not, let's move on to our, uh, we have just two more left. So if you bear with us, we're, we're almost through hearing about all the very interesting intellectual property. Um, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Mark Brimble. Dr. Brimble is a postdoctoral fellow in the library of Dr. Paul Thomas, the Department of Immunology, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Uh, Dr. Brimble studies immunological consequences of adeno associated virus mutated gene therapies. Dr. Brimble has a Bachelor's of Degree in Biochemistry from the University of Bath, United Kingdom, and a PhD in adeno associated virus productions from the Gene Therapy from the University College London, uh, UK as well. Uh, Dr. Brimble, without further ado, uh, thank you very much for presenting your intellectual property. Thank you. Um, oh. Okay, so I think I need permissions to screen share. Yes, hang on one second. Okay, give it a try now. All right. Yep, we see your screen. Great. Okay, thank you for that um, lovely introduction. Yes, uh, I'm Mark Brimble. I uh, work in the field of gene therapy, uh, particularly now studying the immunological consequences of gene therapy. And today, today I'm going to talk to you about some um, IP uh, involved in um, this newly burgeoning field of uh, genetic medicine. So to start, uh, hemophilia is a X-linked bleeding diathesis. Uh, it's got a prevalence of about one in 5,000. And there are two major forms, uh, haemophilia A, which is caused by a deficiency in the factor VIII protein, and haemophilia B, which is caused by a deficiency in the factor IX protein. Now, haemophilia A makes up about 75% of the cases. And actually, that's because um, the gene size is about three times that of uh, factor IX. And uh, both of these proteins are not tolerant to uh, mutation. Uh, almost every position will, um, if it's mutated, will result in a non-functional uh, protein. The current treatment for this disorder is uh, protein infusion three times uh, a week in some cases, which uh, obviously can get very burdensome to the uh, patient. Uh, the most <laughs> famous example of haemophilia uh, would be in the British royal family. So Queen Victoria was actually uh, is suspected to be a de novo mutation uh, in the factor IX gene, which caused for um, haemophilia B to run rampant through the royal family in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Although, of course, be um, because treatment was not available back then, that has actually died, uh, that lineage has died out from the current royal family. So the other aspect of this uh, IP today is, is relates to gene therapy, the alteration of nucleic acids within a person to correct some kind of disease phenotype or other phenotype that you might want to correct. 
And uh, really, it's all about uh, what you deliver and the way you deliver it. And there are a number of ways to deliver your nucleic acid payload. So uh, most of these uh, that have transferred to the clinic have been uh, viral based. So there are a number of viruses such as lentivirus, uh, which is an integrating virus, uh, adenovirus, which is typically used now for oncolytic uh, purposes, but um, has in the past been used for straight gene transfer. And then uh, adeno-associated virus, which is a very popular uh, form. There's also some non-viral uh, mechanisms to deliver a nucleic acid payload, as uh, Deidre uh, spoke about earlier. There's the liposomes, um, and then there's also polymerosomes. And for uh, gene therapy specifically with uh, delivering DNA, uh, typically um, viral methods have been used in the um, in, in the mainstream, but these uh, other non-viral techniques are advancing and uh, may end up providing some sort of uh, replacement. So um, we're gonna focus on AAV, which is the virus that has been used successfully for hemophilia gene therapy. Uh, the wild type AAV genome is highly compact, single-stranded DNA. And there are a number of overlapping uh, replication genes and three overlapping capsid proteins. And those capsid proteins uh, assemble in the nucleus of a, a cell when it's uh, replicating to form a 60 in a one to one to 10 ratio. Um, now, the real utility of the system comes from the fact that whilst this genome is flanked by these inverted terminal repeats, uh, those inverted terminal repeats do not need there are other genes to be packaged within the virus. In fact, you can replace that sequence with any sequence you want. And so typically with gene therapy, you would deliver some sort of cassette uh, with a promoter, a transgene, and, uh, um, and a poly A sequence. Now that transgene can either be a gene of interest, it could be uh, an RNA uh, intermediate, like um, a microRNA, or indeed, it could be the CRISPR protein if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to um, try some gene editing approaches. Uh, but for hemophilia, uh, the way this has uh, worked out is uh, we have delivered a factor nine gene uh, by this liver-specific promoter uh, LP1, and this is this is the crux of the intellectual property. So there are the key elements. So this therapy are the promoter, the LP1 sequence, the transgene, which is factor nine, and the delivery vehicle, which is uh, AAV. So um, what this has actually been, um, th this particular construct has been uh, translated successfully to the clinic and was the subject of a 2010 and 2014 uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper with this exact setup and other uh, setups from companies have um, for uh, the other form of hemophilia, hemophilia A, have also uh, resulted in successful clinical trials just through the intravenous delivery of this adeno-associated virus. So uh, I'm gonna break down the uh, IP into two component parts. Part one is the LP1 promoter. This is derived from the hepatic uh, control region sequence and I think human alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is another liver-specific uh, promoter region. And uh, this promoter is recombinantly derived. So, um, so key elements were taken out of these human sequences and uh, a recombinant form of the promoter was uh, made. And this confers liver-specific transcription. Uh, so in cell culture, in animal models, and indeed in humans. And so the, uh, the useful thing here is, um, is you know, even if your genetic payload is delivered to multiple different tissues, it's only going to produce its product within the liver. And then the final benefit to this uh, promoter sequence is you know, most uh, naturally occurring promoter se sequences span very large regions. And indeed, even um, promoter sequences used in uh, many plasmic cassettes can span well over a kilobase. But this is a relatively short sequence length. It's around 446 uh, nucleotides. And so it can easily fit into delivery vehicles, whether you wanted that to be AAV 
or you wanted it to be one of the other viruses uh, that, is that are used for gene therapy. The other portion of this IP is the uh, codon optimized factor nine. So um, as, as you're all aware, there are 64 codon triplets and you know, even with a couple uh, you know, coding for stops, there are, uh, there's still a lot of redundancy because we only have 20 amino acids from those 64 codon triplets. And actually different organisms have different biases in what codons they choose for, um, for their genome. And, uh, and basically, um, basic, basically you have um, different, different uh, codon sequences that can uh, translate to different efficiencies in how well that prote protein is produced. So the way in which a protein is set up in a natural setting might not be the most efficient because in that system, you might not necessarily want a boatload of that protein produced. But when someone is missing a protein, you want to deliver the highest amount of protein for the lowest dose possible. And so uh, the example here with the factor nine protein, you know, you can uh, alter these residues uh, to, um, to result in silent mutations that have no effect on the protein sequence. And when you deliver the same amount of DNA as the wild type sequence, you result in a much greater uh, amount of uh, protein produced from that. So to summarize, there are two components to the IP. They don't necessarily have to be both used or used together. Now, the LP1 promoter allows liver-specific expression of a nucleic acid construct, and the codon-optimized factor IX allows high-level expression of the factor IX gene. Now, for instance, you know, there are many different liver uh, disorders um, or liver-specific disorders, or indeed things that you would want to perhaps produce from the liver, and indeed with factor nine, you know, the liver is the best target we've, we think so far for producing this uh, within, in a patient. But if you wanted to uh, deliver it to uh, immune cells, for, for instance, uh, by a lentivirus, then, uh, you know, you could use that codon optimized uh, factor nine sequence, but you wouldn't in that case use the LP1 promoter as it uh, confers liver specific production. Uh, so that is, uh, that is, uh, I'm going to be quick and finish here. Uh, so uh, good luck to everyone in this challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brimple. Um, that was very fascinating. Uh, I think we have uh, one question in the, in the chat. Uh, anybody else feel free to add in any more? How are you, uh, so, so the question is, how are you determining which uh, codon sequence is optimal. Um, this can be done by an, a number of methods. You can either rationally design the sequence, and there was some degree of that with uh, the current IP, and uh, that's the, the, um, the sequence was actually uh, designed not just to produce well, but to uh, limit the uh, immune response. So it's been, it was depleted for uh, CPG uh, sequences that uh, through the TLR9 pathway were would be thought to uh, result in greater immune response once you deliver your uh, therapy. So depending on, depending on your application, there are a number of, um, you know, you, you will just try different things and whatever suits your different applications, that's what you would, you would settle on. But there are uh, also, uh, you know, high throughput ways to, to make those determinations. So, you, you know, you can do, uh, massive parallel screens with high throughput sequencing, uh, high throughput uh, DNA shuffling to, uh, to get to where you want to be. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Dr. Brimble? If there are no more, uh, we'll go on to our uh, last speaker. Uh, last but certainly not the least, uh, Dr. Mohamed Shafter from UT uh, Health Science Center. Uh, Dr. Shafter is a prosthodentist and associate professor in the Department of Prosthodentics at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. In addition, Dr. Shafter completed a residency in Doctor of Science at Boston University. Dr. Shafter is interested in CAD-CAM restorative 
dental materials and dental implants. Um, Dr. Shafter, uh, thank you very much for sharing your intellectual property with us. Thank you so much for having me today. Let me try to share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, and thank you for the uh, nice introduction today. Uh, so sorry for the uh, short presentation today. So I was told very late yesterday and I didn't bring all my details for the presentation. So uh, my, uh, uh, my device today, uh, uh, my presentation is quite different from the uh, previous presenters. So my uh, device is, is mainly from the uh, mechanical standpoint. So since I am a, a prosthodontist uh, and uh, uh, I'm dealing a lot with the patients and with the student at UT. So uh, basically uh, I'm gonna tell you uh, about this device as kind of the story. So usually after the pandemic, we, uh, as you know, all of us, like um, we're using a lot of BB, uh, BB and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, we're using double mask and face shield and we use uh, heat caps and we use, uh, uh, beside this, we can use like a, a double of uh, 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 gowns and stuff. So, um, uh, once we saw, we, uh, we're seeing a lot of patients and most of our patients uh, in our department, we do a lot of the uh, uh, longer procedures. So, uh, and uh, uh, since we do the longer procedures like uh, full mouth extractions and place a lot of implant and do a lot of like uh, uh, a lot of prosthesis, dentures, crowns and implants. So uh, we, uh, we get a lot of difficulty uh, to uh, uh, to have the uh, temperature of our uh, field and the uh, fission of the our field. So basically, my device is about the dental surgical helmet equipped with surgical cooling system. So the mainly the device is the kind of the helmet can we fit it in our head, and this helmet will provide three things. Number one, we they provide us the or it will provide me the air. This air go around my scalp and my around my eyes, and uh, uh, and also cool all my scalp, hit the neck, and also um, this air will also uh, come over the lobes or magnifying lenses that I'm gonna use over the helmet, and also will help me to prevent all the fog or cloud that I have it during the longer procedures. So uh, the technology or the device summary is also uh, it's uh, we applied or we claimed as we applied for the patent. So it's a cooling system in form of the heat gear with the uh, forced air cooling system, and uh, this, as I said, this will prevent the uh, the raising the temperature a lot of temperature and also will prevent the, the moisture that comes over uh, the lenses or our lobes. So. Um, most of the problem comes from the when we start any procedure, when we start any like a, uh, when we do any surgery or any processes, uh, we get stimulation to the nervous system. So after the stimulation, that uh, will lead to raise or increase the, our body temperatures. When our body temperature increase, so the respiration will increase and then will reflect more on the. Uh, uh, the air that we uh, use for uh, respirations to affect our vision. So uh, uh, beside that, the, the, long, the, the length and intensity of the uh, procedures that will increase the respiration and the sweating around the, uh, around the, uh, the, the loops. So the solution is very simple. Uh, I try to uh, design the new helmet. As I said, the helmet has two parts, the outer part and inner part. The inner part has a couple of channels where it can dispense or uh, distribute the air through the uh, scalp and the face and the neck. 
and uh, we have another uh, channels go over direct the air uh, around the lobes, around the lobes or magnifying lenses to prevent any fogs or any clouds. And also uh, the other part of the air will go straight to the uh, light and make it uh, prevent the fog around the, uh, over the lights. So this is the, uh, the device that I designed. And it, come, it has like uh, uh, the light here, the light that I use specifically uh, uh, for the uh, during the surgery or during the implant placement. And also I have two loops. The loops is like uh, nothing but is a magnifying lenses that I use. This is like usually 3X or 5X of the normal vision. And it has like a fan. I designed to put the fan to create the air and bag of ice to distribute the air. So, uh, and this is the inner part of the design. So uh, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I try to do a search about the, uh, if there is any existing uh, device like this. Pretty much there is, I mean, nothing specifically like this, but this is the way that I thought about it. And I thought if we can develop it and somehow can help me during the long procedure, either help us as a dentist or a procedurist or help the surgeons who are doing like a six hours, seven hours, like a surgery. So they have a lot of sweat around their vision and they have a lot of, sweat, especially when they wear the lenses or uh, glasses or uh, when they use a double mask and stuff so we need something to cool down the air and cool down the temperature and make the vision is more uh, clear thank you so much for having me and i'm open for any question if you have any question thank you so much uh, dr shafter uh we've got one question in the chat so far uh, can you see the question or would you like me to read it out um would the helmet need it will be a custom model for each customer head. No, it doesn't have to be like uh, customized. It has, it comes with the different, uh, we can like make it bigger or smaller as we want. So we can extend it. There's extender around the, uh, the normal average head and it can, can fit any size. So uh, it, it shouldn't have, I mean, it doesn't have to be customized. So I missed the second uh, slide, what was about. So the second slide is about the problem that we face to create this kind of the helmet. Why we need the air, why we need to cool down the air. So the problems that we have sometimes is, um, I mean, the helmet, it work as a, a barrier to prevent any like a, a transmitted any like saliva or anything from the patient mouth to your face. So we can use it as a protector uh, uh, to the dentist or surgeon or to the patient itself. I think we have uh, one more question on uh, how often and how long a dentist would need to wear this. So uh, uh, usually I recommend to use it if you are, uh, if you using, like, if you have like uh, uh, slightly intensive and long procedures. So if you, for example, or for instance, if you have a patient needs a full mouth extractions and in the same, uh, in the same procedure, you're gonna place a couple implants. So we're talking about like four or five hours. So I really recommend this, I mean, uh, beside the, 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 the BB we were using these days during the pandemic. So yeah, the, any procedure more than one hour, it's highly recommended. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shafter. Uh, with that, we come to the, the end of our uh, IP parade. I'll hand it back to, to Brian. Uh, Brian, go ahead, take it away. Well, that was great. I mean, we always have some great technology, but this one, I think we had a lot of good agriculture stuff, got a, more than a few dental things that we've had in the past. And I think we have a lot of things to choose from. We are going to try to wrap it up rather quickly here, uh, just because we have gone over by a few minutes, but we do want to make sure we get everything covered. Uh, we're going to abbreviate the icebreakers and just do this one. I just dropped a link into the chat 
uh, for this icebreaker. Uh, we're not going to do it here on class, but we'll show what happens next time. This icebreaker is the one word challenge. So in one word, what best describes your desired outcome or effect that your favorite IP will provide to the world? So as you're thinking about what businesses or what uh, IP that you would like to work on, uh, think of one word that would best describe what you think your outcome would be, whether that's change the world, make lots of money, try to put it in one word, but uh, you know the, the drill, just try to get to one word on what you think is gonna be your favorite uh, uh, outcome for your IP that you choose. Um, Shelby, so do we have a form for the IP choices as well? Do you wanna drop that into the chat? Yeah, um, so an important thing to note for everybody, what you'll do here is if you would like to participate this year, you absolutely have to, have to, have to respond to this form. Um, so it'll collect your email. You'll be able to rank what your choices are of what you would like to work on. Like Brian said in the beginning, it's um, very possible that you might not get your first choice. Um, so rank your second, third, you know, and so on choices um, really seriously. And um, you should start hearing from us tomorrow and then possibly over the weekend about what the team assignments are. So I'm dropping the link to that form in the chat now and let me know if you have any issues with it. So go ahead and click on it to make sure that you don't have any issues with it while you have access to me here. The deadline to fill the form, I would prefer that you guys fill the form um, by tomorrow morning, but I understand um, that you're busy and it's getting kind of late. So if you could do it by tomorrow end of day, uh, say around five o'clock, that would be wonderful. And Shelby, could you or Brian also drop the link for the re tonight's recording so everybody knows where to find everyone's presentations and also, if you have any, you know, friends or colleagues who couldn't make it tonight that are really wanting to participate, they absolutely can. They can go back and watch these presentations and fill out the form and still be included in this year's this year's program. Yeah. So, um, oops. So I just sent that to just uh, do that again. Yeah. So I'm dropping my email address into the chat as well. We do a lot of things through chat, so pay attention to that. Everybody's been in there a lot tonight, so I think everybody's got it. Uh, if you want to drop me the, all the intellectual property um, files, so all the PowerPoints or whatever you have, I'll drop them into the folder. Just some kind of housekeeping in that regard. We do have a Google Drive folder. As we get all the participants' emails, we'll start adding you to each one of those folders. Each team will have a folder, start collecting all the information for your specific IP area. Uh, there'll be other folders for the toolkits that we use, the different tools that we use, uh, folders for the recordings. And then we also have a YouTube channel for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation where all of these recordings are going to be. So even though we'll have the decks and you can put them, we'll put those into the team folders, you can also go to YouTube and see this entire video fast forward. What do you want to do to go back and see all these intellectual properties? So everything tonight, including the questions and everything else that were asked, is, has been recorded. We'll send out more information once we have the whole list. That's why it's so important for you to put in your email address and choose uh, what intellectual property you want to work on. That's how we'll know who's participating. And we'll start sending stuff out tomorrow. Typically on Fridays, we have office hours between three and five. Uh, one thing that we'll send you tomorrow morning is the Cypreneur Challenge uh, program uh, guide that we showed earlier. And there's a link in there to sign up for, um, for office hours. Uh, you know, With us just starting tomorrow, there's not a lot of questions asked probably of us. We usually do these office hours after the session to answer questions about the session before, not necessarily the intellectual property. If you do have questions about the intellectual property, uh, we can forward those off to the IP holders or you can contact them directly. Ryan and, and, and uh, uh, Rohan will help us get those to the IP holders as well. So real quickly, we got 818 just for a few minutes, going to open it up for questions, not about the IP, but about the program. So if there's any questions, uh, now's a good time to ask. Cool. All right, so um, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. So uh, do we need to register on Eventbrite, Eventbrite before um, every Zoom session? No, this is, once we have this form filled out with your choices and your participation, you know, and your, um, your email address and everything else, you're in, right? We'll start sending you information. We'll start putting you, plugging you into the programs and plugging you into the teams. Uh, so no, no more Eventbrites. 
And the link that you use tonight is the same Zoom link that we'll use every week. And we'll also put something on your calendar. So once I have everybody, I'll send out a calendar invite for everybody, all the participants with the link and all the information you'll need. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Are y'all using a simple ranked choice voting system? I mean, you get to choose your preference against all the intellectual properties. Um, I'm not, I'm not I mean, sure. And how you tally it. What's that? I mean, and how you tally it. It'll be, so it's first come first serve um, with the IP choices. So the quicker that you get your choice in, um, the quicker it, um, I'll be able to sign you to a team. So that's partially why it's so important to go ahead and fill it out because it makes it easier on me to um, to give you the choices that you want. Good thing I just submitted it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how many are going to be on the team? That depends on how many sign up. Usually we are aiming for at least three on a team. That's what we're hoping for. Um, but sometimes we've had two uh, and sometimes we've had one. Is there anything that we can do before the next session aside from um, answering these responses, uh, the, answering these uh, polls to, to better um, prepare? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. There's a bunch of stuff like the pitch deck that you can review, the couple of canvases that you can review. You'll get all those links tomorrow when we start plugging everybody into the Google Drive. So that's just the background from last uh, from from this program. Also, check out the YouTube channel. We'll send out a link to that as well. In fact, Chelsea, uh, Shelby, while I'm talking about this, can you drop uh, the link to the YouTube channel in there for CEI? Um, <clears throat> that's a great place. We have all the videos from last year as well. Uh, so you can go back and look and see how the program worked and some of that stuff as well. So there's, a, there's plenty of material for you to kind of take a look at. Then after we start next week, there will be homework week after week. So you'll have stuff to, to work on. Hey, just one more thing before we close it out and, and take on maybe one more question. Um, if you know anybody else that might be interested in this, you know, call them tonight, call them tomorrow morning, send, send them the links we have. If they didn't see the intellectual property by tomorrow mid morning, this video will be up on YouTube uh, and they can see all the intellectual property. So they're not that far behind. So if you want to recruit a few more people, the more the merrier. I mean, we would have, love to have five people per team uh, so there's not a, a max or a cap that we're looking at right now. And we have introduced this year and last year, you know, non-science-based participants, right? There are some of them that are working for some of our organizations like St. Jude, but they're not typically in the science space. They might be in the business space. That's also what we're trying to do is trying to bring people together to work on these programs, uh, whether they're in the science space or not, or just have a, you know, an interest in that. So recruit for us if you can. If you have anybody you think might be interested, please let them know. And Shelby just dropped the YouTube channel for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. All the videos are up there. Okay, I got 8.22. I'm gonna open it up just for a few more seconds, see if there's any more questions in the chat or over live. Okay, great. So thank you all very much. We did go over a little bit. We usually do for this first night because we have so much intellectual property to talk about. I think all the presenters did a fantastic job uh, of delivering their IP. It was very easy to understand to a certain extent, obviously, uh, but it's, uh, it's a lot of great stuff. I like to see a lot of this agriculture stuff coming in. The dental works are really there. We got another Kaizen uh, example. We usually have one of those per year that, that little shellfish byproduct stuff seems to be uh, like a wonder drug or wonder material. So I'm looking forward to seeing some Kaizen uh, pitches on the end of this one as well. I think it's the third year in a row we've had something like that. So let's, uh, let's really go at it. Let's really try to commercialize these things and see where we can get in the next 10 weeks. Thanks, everybody. That'll do it. Thank you all, especially presenters. Thank you very much. <laughs>